Welcome to another episode of DD on the Spot. As always, I'm your host, Ryan Johnson. Before I get to our guest here today, I'd like to remind everyone that if you enjoy this content, to please give a like and subscribe down below. We greatly appreciate it. We have Mandy Squires us. She's a mom of two. She's a physique competitor, a raw power lifter, and fitness enthusiast. And she's also coming to us all the way up from Canada. Mandy, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. I'm very happy to be here. Absolutely. So why don't you give us a little bit of a backstory on what inspired you to adapt that healthy and fit lifestyle? Um, well, it started quite young for me, actually. Um, so uh, I grew up in my teenage years. Um, I had a single dad and um, but he kind of it, he was working nights. So I was always just kind of on my own. And I started getting self-conscious just as you go into the preteen years. So I really just started uh, getting into the gym, just dealing with the self-conscious feeling like I needed to lose weight, uh, was, um, I just wanted to be skinny at first, really. And so a very opposite of what I am today. I didn't have the education at that time. And you look at, um, mainstream and you just see all these skinny, skinny women. And I just wanted to be skin and bones. And actually I, um, went through a period of where I was anorexic and bulimic, and I've been in denial for that for a very long time. Even when I um, had healed from that, I still wasn't able to even admit that I had gone through that. But now being um, more mature and uh, in my years now and knowing a lot more than what I did then, I can stand back and say, yes, um, I did go through that. And, and I did find actually learning and educating myself in the health and fitness industry was the thing that I needed to be able to get over that. And when you got started, like I always like to say, if you were to walk into a gym with a hundred people, there's a hundred different ways that people got into shape. There's a hundred different ways that they did reps, what exercises they did, what the nutrition was like. Was that hard for you specifically starting out to sort of find out what worked best for you personally? I'm going to say nothing that has been difficult for me. <laughs> it's all a self-discovery. Um, and there is no one way. And that's the beauty of it. When you realize, like, you can't just go in there and just be like, hey, this is how I work out. This is exactly how many reps I'm going to do. And then you continue with that forever. No, it's never it's never a single process. And it's always an ongoing journey and an ongoing learning um, also to keep it exciting for yourself is you cannot just keep it one way. And that's how you keep progressing is by switching things up and doing different things. But you do, you go, you do something a certain way and you sort of, you, um, master that, not really master it, but you, you stick to that for a little bit of time and, and then you switch it up and then you can, and then later you can go back and then incorporate that again. And that's how your body just keeps progressing because you have to keep, your body moving and, and, and learning and guessing what you're going to do. So. And when you were getting started, did you find that your body adjusted really, really quickly or did it take a little bit more time for you to start seeing those results? Um, so if we're talking about maybe when I really got serious into bodybuilding, because it's been a progression over time when it was okay. When I first started out and I was 16 years old, it took a lot Okay, so there's different parts in my journey and, and different areas of where my life was. So when I was 16 and, and thinking anorexic, so just thinking, okay, less food in, more calorie and expend more calories out and just try and I was trying to get under a thousand calories a day. And um, if I went over that, then, you know, all hell would break loose. But um so that was a different mindset. So going into that mindset in the beginning and just transforming that into knowing, learning that in order to burn more fat, you actually and increase your metabolism. So eating more. So that was really difficult for me at first in the very beginning, just wrapping my mind around that because it was just like, no, you know, numbers versus numbers and not really knowing all the other chemi chemical reactions in your body that are much different than that because the body is so magical it's not just it's not just input output there's so many other things that go into it your stress your sleeping there's so many other um the nutrition that you're actually putting into it so um that was very difficult in the beginning now if we are talking in terms of after many years um just being in the gym and uh, learning, picking up things here and there. But after I had my second child and I just um, decided to go into the gym and then I was separated from my husband and I really dove into the competition lifestyle. And 
at that point, just being older and just having done things for such a lot, um, a greater length of time and having more knowledge going into it was a lot easier for me because it was just, just go in there and you're just doing it. And it just, everything sort of happened naturally. So it was a progression because I wasn't just holding on to, like, I wasn't sick from being anorexic. I was going in there with a whole different mindset. I was going in there for the joy, just pure joy of fitness. And then once I, I wasn't even going to compete at first, but my body just transformed into where competitors look like. And then everybody was like, well, why don't you compete? And that was always something that I held inside. It was a desire that I had and it just transformed and became what it is today. Really. That's awesome. And one of the myths that we love to bust here on the podcast, I mean, it has gotten better over the last like five years, I'd say because of Instagram, but women, some women still have this belief that if they touch one weight, they're going to Hulk out and become Dwayne, the rock Johnson overnight. And that they're just going to somehow put on like 50 pounds. Did you ever have that fear when you were starting out? And if so, how'd you overcome it? And then if you ever hear that excuse from women today, what is your main response? Okay, yes. I don't get that question a lot because I think I do carry such a large amount of muscle mass, so people don't tend to ask me that kind of question today. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I Did I have that fear? I mean, when I first started out to gain muscle, I didn't know. I didn't. There was so much that I didn't know. I didn't know that these fitness women existed. And all I knew was that there was a skinny model type uh, supermodels. So when I met my boyfriend, who is a personal trainer, and that's how I got into it, because first, I just want to be skin and bones. And then he uh, went into the gym, just started working out. It was a cardio bunny, just constantly cardio. And then he's he said, you have the potential to compete. And he's like, if you're willing to do a bodybuilding competition, I will train you for free. And I was like, yeah, free training. Sure. <laughs> I'm like, I know what you want, but okay, you're not getting that, but I'll get my free training. But, um, I did end up in a relationship with him. Um, but, uh, then I started, it just opened my eyes and I looked at fitness magazine. There was, um, they're not long muscle muscle and fitness or yeah. So there was that magazine. And when I saw women with, um, abs, I just absolutely fell in love and I was like, Oh, that's what I want. That's the physique that I want. So, um, I never seen with a large amount of muscle till probably later on. I didn't know that that existed till later on in my years. And I didn't want that at first. And there's a different, different types in, there's nothing wrong with what anyone wants, but what you need to know is what do you want for yourself? And it takes a very large amount of work to be able to get to that and like a female bodybuilder versus, you know, either just having being fit. So the bikini type competitor to the figure, to the women's physique, to the, to the women's bodybuilding. Like there is so much more that goes into it. So, so much nutrition, so much science, so much supplements, so much, so much work that no, if you pick up a weight, you're not going to look like that. But what you will look, uh, you will be stronger. Your muscle will look better. When what what is your goal and what you're trying to do? If you do want to have a fit look, um, if you do want to lose some body fat, the best way to do that is to have some muscle mass. Now there are different variations of muscle mass, and there's also different body types, and you can you learn to work with that. But if you're scared to pick up a weight, you're never going to get there and you're never going to advance. And then there's different ways and you can monitor that. And you, and if you see that you're getting too much muscle, you can change and incorporate, change your workout to sort of shape yourself um, differently, but you do have to work with what your genetics are as well. So you're not going to, you're not going to end up looking like someone you don't want to look like. If you don't want to look like something, you're not going to look like something. And a lot of the missing aspect, I think, to um, any physical, anything that you do, really, you can take this into into all different parts of your life that you're like into your work, into art, into what you want. That's what you want, what you feel. And if you're taking that into whatever it is that you're doing, that's how you're going to get to a certain level. 
So if you going into something and you don't want something and you're fearing that, I mean, just think of how hard the women who do want it have to work right? They're, they're wanting this so bad and they have to work so hard to get it. So don't think that, you know, you don't want it. You're going to pick up a piece of weight and you're going to look like that. No, it's not going to happen. Absolutely. And we're going to bust this myth in about five seconds. Mandy, could you give us a flex real quick? And I was going to say, does she look like Dwayne, the rock Johnson? Does she look like Hulk Hogan? And she's been, look at that. And she'd been working out for how long and it's taken her that long. And that's what I always say to people. It's like, they do not look like it's it's one of my biggest myths that I love to bust because you've been working out for that long. And I always tell the story about, I had a f- good friend in college who I'd work out all the time in college because that's when I really got into it. And she would always say, you know, like, I really want to go with you, but I don't want to get, you know, too big. I don't want to put on so much muscle. And then th- this went on for like a couple months. And then I finally one night said to her, I said, look, the amount of weight that you have in your purse that you carry around all the time when we go out to eat to, or go to other places weighs a lot more than most of the dumbbells in that gym. And you're not putting on any muscle or any mass from carrying that around. And that finally sort of convinced her to come in so I think it's just one of those things where you just have to overcome that fear and then as soon as you pick up a weight or as soon as you touch a weight I really think that fear can really go away and then another big one that we always talk about or deal with especially with girls that I've talked to is that there's always that fear kind of going in that there's just going to be these big 400 pound guys in there that are just going to be really intimidating and just you know kind of be like mean spirited or whatever and then I always say to that it's like 99% of the people in there don't even know that you exist because they're too busy focusing on themselves during their workouts because it's their personal like reflection time So it's Mm -hmm. just, it's always just, you know, getting in there and just busting those stereotypes because once you sort of get used to it, it, it does, it does, you do realize that, you know, all these things that you were kind of brought up on were, are are untrue. So it's just get in there and just get started. But I love to talk about first preps. What was your first prep like? Because I mean, your nutrition could be super clean. It could be super good when you're first starting out, but nothing compares to the prep. It's like you are really taking things up an extra, extra notch. What was that experience like you when you prep for the first time? (laughs) people are going to be floored about my first prep. Okay. Definitely do not follow what I did. (laughs) Um, so my first prep, I did not know what I know now. And I'm the type of person I've, and here's the thing. I've never had a coach and I've never really had a personal trainer either, but for working out with friends and just absorbing that from everyone. So Um, I just decided to dive into the competition and I definitely should have done a lot more research than what I did. But um, my, my frame of mind was I wasn't going in there to win. I was going in there to absorb, to figure it all out. So, but my first prep, I lived off of banana and peanut butter sandwiches. Wow. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So, um, and I, you know, considering uh, banana and peanut butter sandwiches, they look pretty good. If I had learned how to, um, the stage presence and, and the, um, the posing a lot more, I definitely would have placed a lot better because my physique wasn't too bad. Uh, I definitely needed work, but it was pretty good considering that. So, uh, don't do that. Don't do a prep of banana and peanut butter sandwiches. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I, uh, that's probably the best. That's probably the best first prep story we've ever heard. But out of all the all the ones that I've heard, absolutely. So, what was the fir- your first experience like when it came down to posing? Like, we always have guests on here that always say, you know, posing is the hardest thing, hands down. Your training, your nutrition, posing can be the hardest thing, and it's always uh, it's a never ending process. Like, you can never be perfect at posing. There's always stuff you have to work on. What was that first experience like with you when it came to the posing? And what would you say is the hardest thing that you had to deal with starting out? Okay, so like my first first time again. So I went in as figure because I already like I've already I knew I carried a lot of muscle mass just naturally because I was always in the gym. So my arms genetically, um, everybody's like, how much do you lift? I don't actually train my arms that hard oh, wow. because of genetics. So I went in as figure and I didn't know how to pose. I actually learned it the day of my competition. Wow what I was supposed to do. I was like, Oh oh my God, like you have to know how to pull. Like there's a certain way you got to be on stage. Like I literally did not watch and people, 
yeah, I know people are going to be very upset uh, about this. Like, how can you go into a competition and people will turn up your nose like you you're Mickey Mousing it like it's but I I just I didn't know anything. And I just I knew that this was something I wanted to do a passion. And the only thing that I knew was just to go in there and just do it. So but if, when you look at my when you go from my first competition to my second competition, the second competition, I took first place in figure. So I took that. I took what I learned in the first competition and I knew I was going into it and I knew I was going into it blindsided and I knew I was here to absorb everything that I possibly could to figure out my next step. What did I need to do? How, how do everybody go about this? I knew nothing. So the second competition, I definitely took all of that and, and showed that, no, I wasn't just messing around. Like I really wanted to know. So, and the biggest thing that I learned from my competitions was the how important the posing is how important it is no matter what your physique looks if you don't know how to display that physique properly if you don't know your body then that's what sets it because you can have lagging body parts and if you know how to actually present and pose that it can make the whole difference even between you know getting that first first to second to third place and it's something that you always want to work on and improve on I mean I've read things like you know Arnold he's had he's had um like his legs were always small but he always knew to keep those fire constantly while he's on stage like because you have to be mentally aware of what you need to be doing and how to present yourself so Posing is very, very important, and it's still something that I'm still working on constantly. And you know what? Once the more you do it, the more you begin to love it too. So when if you're loving something, the even better, the better it gets. So, at what point did you decide to go from figure to physique? Was that something that you always wanted to do, or was it something where you just realized, like, hey, I'm getting too big for figure? Yeah, it, that's exactly what happened. I just realized I was getting too big for figure for the to get in the placing that I wanted. Um, and I came in maybe lean to lean as well. Um, so I had done I had done my competitions quite um, like all a lot, uh, a whole bunch of competitions quite close together in about two years. So I went I did figure. My first competition was figure. Then I did. Um, then I did a figure in one, one first place. Then I did, um, I did figure in a different competition, FE. I won second place. Then I did provincials and I got like, I can't re quite remember my placing, but my placing was like eighth or 10th or something like that. And that's when I knew at that point that, okay, now my body's just responding so much better and I'm putting on muscle mass and um, in order and everybody was saying, would, would make comments like, oh, you're taking juice, you're doing this. And I'm like, no, I'm not. Um, <laughs> I was completely natural at that point. So then I decided to go um, to uh, try women's physique. My first one was the Berry Naturals in which I did both figure and women's physique just to see how the placing would go and to determine where I would branch off from then. And then I did third place in figure and second place in women's physique. And so then I was like, okay, well, let's go with physique. <laughs> and then, yeah, went with physique from there. That's, that's awesome. So what was your nutritional change like when you went from figure to physique? Did you have to eat a little bit more? What was your experience like with that? Yeah, so I don't I I think maybe I was already increased cuz from my first competition of the banana peanut butter banana sandwiches <laughs> onward then um learning okay, well, let's go. Let's increase my protein, which I knew before, but I was just playing around. But um so then I just increasing my protein and just eating good, clean foods. So just protein. I never really significantly, b besides that, that first time to the, to the next, changed my eating patterns too much. But just like every few hours, making sure you're getting a protein, protein source in and having like some uh, vegetables in there. I never, ever like went too crazy in terms of like just trying to get 
like three to 4,000 calories. My body doesn't need that type of work where some bodies do. And you need to know your body. You need to know your metabolism. So my, my body, it just gains muscle quite easily as long as I am feeding it the nutrients that it needs. And you have to think of your body needs the nutrients. It needs, it needs the proteins and it needs, it needs the different vitamins and minerals. So those like feed it the good food. Don't go out and feed it the crap food. If you're feeding it, you want to put as much good food in your body. And as well as, to be honest, I don't eat or I don't use too many protein supplements and stuff like that. I do when I'm when I and then in the first part of my prep because I'm trying to get more protein in it and then reduce my calories and keep my metabolism going, but when I'm not competing, I really don't have protein too protein supplements too much like instead I'll eat real food like chicken. Chicken mostly chicken or steak. So I'm just reaching for those types of things. That's that's great. So I always love to ask people, I mean, I'm a super tan person. My, I mean, I'm a super pale person myself. What was that experience like for you putting that tanner on for the first time? We have so many people on here that say, you know, like to see everything pop out and to see like muscles you never even knew you had. It's just an eye-opening experience. What was that experience like for you that first time, so that first competition when you put that tan on? <laughs> that was like, okay, so my first, because I've always... So I've been self-conscious and leading into like being, um, being happy with my body. I'm the best satisfied, happy, loving my body the most that I ever have been. So the first, first time is just mostly being shy with having to be completely naked and have someone spray you. So I was like, (laughs) what I got to do? Like, Oh my God, you're like spraying me. But I had the most kind, beautiful person, Louise from Monica's son tan and she was absolutely wonderful and made me feel so comfortable so that was great and just to meet her and have meet just meet new people that are just loving and in in the industry was really nice so um but seeing yeah no noticing that it popped I loved it I I love seeing um I love the tan I I always loved having the tan so yeah. And I mean, uh, all the people uh, some seem to think that when you put that tan on, that people just all of a sudden think that it's just a, an easy process, but they don't realize that you can't really sit down on stuff. You can't really move around too much because you're going to, you're going to spread it. You kind of just got to be sedentary for a couple of days. That's one of the things that I always love to point out where people just think that you can just basically free roam, but no, you kind of got to be, that's why you sometimes see these competitors in like towels and stuff like that, where they just can't spread it so much. So it is kind of a process where you do have to be really careful once you put it on. But probably my most important question that I love to ask is people don't realize is that when you guys are doing your shows that you've sort of manipulated your body through all of the working out and all the nutrition into looking a way that's not sustainable. Like you're not going to look that way 24 seven, which is what some people think. Some people look at these bodybuilders or competitors and just say like, oh, they must be jacked and shredded just 24 seven. But it's not the case. But for you mentally, how do you sort of prepare yourself or how do you deal with the fact that, you know, I am not going to look this great for like the whole entire year that after this competition's over, I am going to put on weight and I am not going to be as lean and shredded. How do you prepare yourself mentally for that? Um, well, how does one prepare for that is just first getting the knowledge. I think, you know, people who go into it blindsided, just watching Instagram type posts, maybe that might take your brain into thinking that people look like that all 24 seven. But what people, a lot of people need to realize is that these competitors, they're not even looking like that a lot of times. They're getting all their photo shoots and they're building a library so that when they're off season, they're just still posting those shots. So they don't, they don't look like that all the time. So I think that, you know, social media can kind of mess your head up in that way. So, um, But the more people you know, maybe in the industry or talk to, um, can maybe put your kind of bring you back to reality and be like, oh, that person competes. Because I remember, I remember when I first started to seeing people that were off season and thinking, wow, that person competes. Like, I can't tell at all. And just, I never really shared that because I never wanted to hurt anybody's feelings or anything in my head. But those are things because I had to. I was going through things and I had to deal with, you know, my feelings and what I'm going through. And this was all new to me and stuff like that. But another thing is like, I never get too 
you have to watch because everybody's a human being. Everybody's going through their own things and everybody's doing their own things. And some people do go way off in between, uh, like in their off season and put on a whole bunch of weight. And some people don't. And, you know, what is right or wrong? You know, that's going to be individual to yourself and to your own body. But you just have to go in and remember health first. So like, if you're going in there and you're enjoying, you need to enjoy what you're doing. If you're really enjoying, enjoy every process of it, because every part of it is a process and every part of it does have a purpose. And, and you have to enjoy your body in every phase that you are. And if you're enjoying the whole process and you're going to naturally progress and it's going to be a good thing for you. But if you're finding you're going through it and you're hating this and hating that, you need to step back and you need to ask yourself because every process is, it's not like as much as it is physical, that it's a physical thing that you're doing. It teaches you so much about if you're being open to it, it teaches you so much about yourself, about what's going on inside your head and those types of things. And it can really give you growth in so many aspects. So if you sit back and be like, okay, well, why am I so upset that I'm not, you know, shredded all the time? And like, what is this telling me about me? And you need to really sit back and handle those things. And then once you're handling those things and you're happy, if you're happy, I think like how your physical um, way that you carry yourself, like if you're happy, it just exudes from you. And, and naturally, like you're not going to be fighting those things like you're going to look, I, I don't know how I'm going to explain, but you're just going to be in a, if you're in a good mental state, then it's going to show physically and it's going to be more easier to be in the area that you should look and you cannot be, and people don't like you to look exactly stage, stage ready. And I did go through those things too, because I love, I love being ripped. I do. I love the abs. I love being ripped. And, and for, I'm, I, do relatively stay lean more so, but I am, I do currently have the more body fat than I had before. And for a bit there, while I was getting the more body fat, I did had to, because even though I did, I am healed from the anorexia and bulimia, but sometimes those, the, those things come up again and you have to catch those and, and figure those things out and just, um, it's just like an addict with anything. Sometimes you get triggers or you're like, oh, my God. So it's a constant work in progress. Everything in life is a work in progress. And you you just go with that. And you just have to, when those thoughts come up, catch them, assess them, realize what they're telling you about yourself, and then you're able to go through and handle it. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. It's just it's all a struggle. And it's one of those things that all the people that we've had on that are bodybuilders or competitors all go through. And just to realize that like, you're not alone. If you ever had those feelings where you're like, Oh, I can't believe that I'm putting on all this weight. I mean, everyone goes through that. Nobody stays stage lean 24 seven. Cause it just wouldn't be healthy. I mean, you would, you would get very, very unhealthy if you tried to do that year round. I mean, some people have tried and sometimes, you know, it hasn't gone so well for them. So I really just love to stress that out. But now being a mom, how important is it for you to be in shape? Because kids can sometimes be a handful. They're just full of energy. They're running around all the time. They're always, you know, just loads of energy. How important is it for you to be physically fit just to be able to keep up with them? <laughs> oh my God, do my kids have energy? <laughs> it's so true. But you know what? Here's another thing to look at it. Because I trained so hard too, I had to sit back and like, sometimes I had, like, I haven't competed in quite some time now in three years, because I had to sit back and look at, okay, what do I really want for myself? What do what's going on with um, what's important here? Not that I can't compete with kids, I certainly can, and I'm certainly going to compete again. But um, just had a lot of things to handle on my own with real life and life is life and it comes up and you handle it. But when you're sore all the time and competing too, that can zap your energy. And then when you have kids and, and that are full of energy, you don't want to be constantly taking away from that part in your life as well. So you have to just be able to find the balance in that because I found, yeah, being women's physique is a lot harder so you can't compete as much as like, say, when you're doing figure bikini and whatnot. So we have to measure those things. But in terms of being fit, yeah, it's 
it definitely helps with your kids and be able to um, play with them and hang out with them because they're full of energy. And plus, you want to, I think it's more important today because back in the day, kids would always be going outside and they would be, they would be fit and whatever. They would be doing their thing and parents were able to be in, they were doing their own things. But today's day and age is completely different. You've got, you've got gamings, you've got all these electronics and kids are not going out. They're not being physical like they were. And plus everybody's so scared to let their kids go out now and play because, you know, you hear kidnappings, this and that, and nobody wants to give them that freedom. So they have less freedom now. And then in order to fill that time with that less freedom, they're using electronic. What do you do in that scenario? You need to be doing things as a family that's active and going out. And so that can incorporate all of you together, which has the benefits. So um, like on the weekends and stuff or, you know, in the summer, I'm not really a winter person. I don't like the cold, but like, I'm always trying to do something with my kids. So like, yes, maybe I'm not in the gym, but like, what can I do that's physical as a family with our kids? And, and sometimes as a competitor in that lifestyle, you get so like, like this and you think like, just the gym, just the gym, just the gym. No, there's so many more things out there. As long as you're moving your body and being active, that, keeps you in that maintenance so like your off days or whatnot are what are they they don't have to be just sitting on the couch or whatnot so go out and just be doing something that's physical going for walks going swimming you know going to a trampoline park doing those types of things and that's gonna aid into your your physical whole makeup of everything that you're doing How important is it to you also to sort of portray, you know, a positive image, especially for your kids that, you know, muscles can be good for women. I mean, women can be awesome with muscles. So then when they look at you and they say, oh my God, my mom is like in such great shape. I could be like that. How important is is it for you to sort of have that positive message for your kids? It's very important for me to put a healthy image out there. So whether my kids want to have muscles or not, that's up to them. I want them to flourish and to do being, they have their own personalities and I'm not supposed to control them. I'm just supposed to guide them. So what they decide that they want for themselves, that's up to them. But I want them to be physical and know about being healthy with food and to just have a completely healthy outlook because what's important, I don't want my kids to be going through that type of that being anorexic and self-conscious like that. And I went through that and I don't want that for them. Can I completely make sure that they don't go through that? No, we can't control things. We can't control people. We can only control what we do, what our own thoughts are and what, what we can portray to them and what we can guide them. So it's, super important that they see that I'm making good choices, that I'm educating them, giving them the education so that they can make the right choices. But it's absolutely, I love watching them grow. And my youngest, she's always, it's so funny to see because each of them have their different personalities too. So, and it's really cool to see my oldest. She's not as into physical things. Like she's more into art and and youtube and stuff like that and i don't know if that's maybe her age she's nine ten and then my youngest she's like six but she just naturally she's like i have some fitness magazines so she'll go into the bathroom she'll read the fitness magazines and then she'll like be doing push-ups and stuff like that all on her own lunges all on her own i'm like you're you're amazing that's so good and then so it's just cool and then she's like they they flex all, all the time and uh so they kids Kids take on, if you want your kids to do something, you you have to be the one to do it. Like telling them doesn't help. And I read and I saw, I don't know, maybe this was a meme or something or a, like a little thing, a post. So, which really struck a chord with me is, um, so there's someone like, um, something about like, how did you get your, your kids to read all the time? And then the, it went on to say, well, kids practice what they see, not what, not what they're told. So if you want something for your kids, then be the example. Don't tell them, be it. Absolutely. I always love to ask this question when it comes to 
you know, having kids, they're going to have their own type of nutrition. I mean, they're going to eat the kid things. They're going to have burgers, pizza, all that type of stuff. Has that ever been hard for you, especially when you're on prep to see them eating all that stuff and to just think deep down like, okay, focus. I can't have that. I can't have that. I'm on prep. Has that ever been difficult for you? No, (laughs) I'm a different animal. I don't know. It's never been difficult for me Um, because of this. Because it wasn't, I can't have it. It was more, my mindset was like, this is them and I have a goal. Like, this is what, I can have this, I can have that, blah, blah, blah. Like, this is, this is its purpose, you know? And I was dead set on that and giving them their food and, and I would be proud. Like, that's just something to be proud of, like to have that control, you know, that's just an, another addition. What kind of additional thing to learn out of life is to have that, that control where you're not trying to dip in. And, um, yeah, it does definitely takes a lot of focus and mind power, but if it's like, you have to, you not, you can't be focusing on what you can't, you have to be focusing on what you're doing, what you can and, and your purpose and keep that in sight rather than, Oh, I can't have this. Oh, I can't do that. Oh, I have to do this. Oh, I have to like, it's very negative, but if you're switching it to like, okay, Oh, you know, I'm eating this. I'm going to get like, I'm going to lose more body fat. I'm going to be more competitive. And like, you just focus on that. And then it completely changes everything. And then one of the things that I realized when I started working out a lot in college and, you know, getting bigger and stronger, the one negative thing for me that I found out is that you're going to get asked to move a lot of people's furniture. You're going to get asked to open a lot of pickle jars. You're going to get asked to do a lot of different things. Have you ever had that experience where people just assume because you look strong that you can like move their furniture for them or that you can open stuff for them? And if so, how do you deal with that? I open, I open it for them and I move their furniture. (laughs) (laughs) And I do it with a smile. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I came to find, I mean, at first I was like, because my summers are just stacked up usually with weekends where there's like, hey, I got a chair or a couch that I need you to help move. So I do it. But then now I take it sort of as a compliment because they do appreciate, you know, or it does seem like they do notice, you know, sort of some of the hard work that I put in the gym. So it is, it is definitely something that I sort of take as a compliment now. But my favorite question to ask, and I always tell everyone before I ask the question that this is a multi-million dollar idea to come up with, so come up with it. But when it comes to women who are muscular and big, they don't really have that many clothing options for you. When it comes to, like I always say, if you have big shoulders, you know, dresses are kind of, you know, you're out of luck when it comes to that. Or jeans are another big thing that we hear where it's kind of almost impossible to buy. How have you sort of found a way to compensate for the fact that your clothing options can be limited? Yeah, that's been, that. that's definitely one that's been um, kind of a work in progress. I'm like, okay, realizing because when, before I used to like, I didn't have to try on clothes and I've had to learn that it's taken me a few things of just buying things, taking it home and be like, oh, this doesn't fit over my arms anymore. I'm like, oh, or my back or like, I break it. I'm like, shit, I really like that. Damn it. <laughs> um, but uh, so now when I shop, <laughs> Um, if they have arms in it, um, I know definitely going to have to try this on before I buy it. I'm looking for things with stretch. Um, but I I did find, and fashion Nova has been really good. So with, uh, women, is there, um, clothes seems to like their jeans always, they fit perfectly. So I found that site to be really good, but, um, otherwise, uh, I have to try it on. Yeah. That's what I've, that's what I've always said. Like if anyone has an idea that for like a, a sportswear that would like really help out, that's a, that's a great idea. And you'd probably make a lot of money off of that. But now we go to our favorite part of the podcast, my personal favorite and the audience personal part of the favorite, the little questionnaire at the end where it's sort of going to be a getting to know you where we're going to ask Mandy here about a dozen or so questions and see how she stacks up to everyone else. So for the first oh. question, well, yeah. so for the first <laughs> question, what is your go-to workout song at the moment? Oh my goodness. Um, I'm, I'm such a person that just like, doesn't choose anything. I'm very moody all the time. It really depends on my mood. So I'll just put on like, um, a lot of times I just put on like deep house. Um, I just put on a house mix and I just put on like SoundCloud and like, just pick something random and then just go with it. Yeah. So now out of all the celebrities on the planet, if you could work out with any celebrity, who would it be? Oh, the rock. (laughs) 
<laughs> our most popular answer by far. That's like 90% of the guests. And yeah, I, I personally would that or Arnold. I mean, those two, yeah, by far, I definitely work out with those, but now out of all the celebrities on the planet, if you could train any celebrity, who would it be? Mm, oh my goodness. I never thought of this. Let's say David Beckham. <laughs> that's our first David Beckham. We usually get like a Kevin Hart or something like that. But yeah, David Beckham, that is that is definitely a great choice. That would be he would be a fun person to train, I think, too. And plus I, I had a British guy on here and those accents, yeah, I wouldn't be able to focus just because those accents like I felt like ten percent I felt like I gained like ten IQ points when I was talking to the one British guy I had on just because they just sound so in smart and so intelligent that I just I, <laughs> I couldn't I couldn't deal with it. They can say the dumbest things and you're like, wow. Yeah, and you're like, wow, that's so insightful. Great. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I, I found that to be true 100%. But what is one item that you always need to have in your fridge? Chicken. Yep. Where do you mainly get your chicken from? Do you just, uh, is it, do you usually get the natural chicken or is there a specific type that you love? Um, well, recently I just uh, ordered a whole order from um, from a farm that has all organic and natural. So I got a year supply, so. Oh, wow. Yeah, that, that's a lot. That's a lot of chicken. So <laughs> what is one well, thing I mean, that it's pe- chicken and beef? and? <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, that's that's got to be a big chunk of your diet. So that's what you know, you're going to need to eat a lot of meat. But what mm-hmm. is one thing that people who follow you on Instagram would be surprised to know about you if they met you in person? Hmm. If they met me in person, um, maybe that I'm. A lot of them are surprised that they find out how short I am, perhaps. What's your height? 5'2". Five, five, oh, wow. Yeah, I'm 6'3", so yeah, a good a good full foot and an inch taller. But yeah, that's that's one thing that I've come to find out, too, is that even with some of these guys that we've had, I'm, where I'm like, how tall are you? And they're like, I'm 5'7", where it's like, yeah, these some of these people look like they're like six feet tall when they've been on. Now, granted, I did have the tallest ever competitive figure girl ever, and she was 6'3", and that was like, okay, you actually are tall. So that's yeah. that's a thing. But like, I, yeah, all the people, it's usually, you know, that's one of the big things that we get. And do you find that being shorter? I mean, I, I just can't imagine maybe how satisfied you must be sometimes when you go into a gym and people, you know, you maybe you're wearing like a sweater or something like that. And people don't see how big you are. And then when they see you like max out on something, just to see them just get really like surprised. Has that ever happened to you? And you just kind of get a thrill out of that. <laughs> um, it doesn't happen as much anymore because now my muscles don't even hide yeah. through sweaters. Yeah. But before, mm-hmm. yes. It used to happen, and I love it. <laughs> I, love, I love the I love the surprise. Yeah, that happened one time when I was at a gym, and I saw a guy walk in there, and he looked like you know he was like five foot five or whatever, and he had a sweater on. You couldn't tell anything, and then he's like maxing out like two hundred eighty pounds benching, and I was like, oh crap, that was that was really impre- that made my day. Where I was like, you guys wouldn't believe what I saw today in the gym. So yeah, it's it's definitely one of those things that I that I love to see. But what was the last TV show that you binge watched? Um, I don't watch too much TV to be honest, but, um, what was it called? Oh, hold on. It's one where it's a UK one and I can't remember the name of it, but, um, it was about like, um, robots and robots having, being, um, having consciousness. It was really good. Oh, I, um, I, Westworld. No, it actually, no, but it's like, I know it's the same kind of idea, but this is different. Huh. Cause that one, there was assimilation. Westworld was about, there's assimilation, like yeah. people can go to this area, but this is just like, um, like in the whole world, I'll have to find out the, uh, the title of that, but it's, uh, it's, it was based in the UK and then they uh, people had robots as workers oh. and they look like people. And then um, one by one, they are started getting consciousness with a certain code. Oh, wow. Yeah. I'll definitely, I'll definitely have to look into that, but what is your favorite TV show of all time? <laughs> uh, Ellen. I like watching Ellen. Ellen. That is our first Ellen that we've ever had on the show. So there's one for Ellen. Mine, I'm just going to be the most basic person ever and just say it's a tie between friends and the office for me. I mean, it depends on what day it is as to whether or not I what show is my favorite. But yeah, those are mine. But what is a guilty pleasure movie that you enjoy? Uh, like, 
I'm terrible. I'm terrible at this stuff. I have the worst memory. And then like I watch a movie and I only watch it once and then I completely forget it. And then if I watch it again, I'm like, I think I saw this. And then I'll be trained the whole movie. I'm like, yeah, I'm pretty sure I saw this one. <laughs> so I don't like, I don't like really have a lot of favorites. I don't know why I'm like that. I just don't really say like, oh, this is my favorite movie or this is what I like to watch. Um, so I don't know. I can't really answer that. <laughs> we'll just say, we'll just put down undecided. But now I noticed that you have tattoos. Are there any stories behind your tattoos and what they mean? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, my tattoos are the flowers. So they're the birth flowers. So the chrysanthemum is my oldest uh, daughter's birth flower. The gladiolus um, is my youngest daughter's birth flower. The lily, because my daughter's name is Lily. Rose, because that's my birth flower. The lotus, because through the mud, you know, you beautiful things grow through through dark things. Um, the leopard spots, because my spirit animal <laughs> um and uh what else do i have a dream catcher just obvious um then i have a mermaid on my thigh because i always used to want to say i wanted to be a mermaid as a kid i'm from newfoundland so um love the water and the ocean and that type of scene i've got a dragon fly on my foot i share that same tattoo with my two stepsisters oh yeah and this this one I share with my other, um, or stepsisters, half sisters, sorry, half sisters. And, uh, this is the, is the most recent one. So the eye, um, protector of like, um, jealousy as well as the chakras. I'm surprised that you didn't get like one of those tattoos that when like you flex it, like become something it doesn't for like bodybuilding or whatever. That'd be like the perfect thing for the judges. If you got like one of those where like, I, I forgot what it was, but they always have them on like TV shows where like people flex and then it becomes like something else. They're like, Oh, look at this tattoo or whatever. I'm surprised. Cause that would be, that would be definitely a great idea. So I don't know if you, I mean your other arm that isn't all tied up, that might be an idea that you might want to do for a, for your, when you come back to bodybuilding, that would be, that'd be pretty funny if someone did that. So absolutely. <laughs> and at what age did you get your first tattoo? 16 16 yeah i haven't gotten a tattoo myself i might get one but i've had you know friends of mine that you know just get like the ankle tattoos or stuff like that so if i get one you know that probably might be one of the things that i get but i i don't know i don't know what i would get but i gotta ask for all of our canadian guests i always find this super super fascinating are, do you live in the region where they serve milk and bags yeah Okay, we finally have one, people. Our sixth try, we finally got one. So what? What is there a like reason behind that? I just find that so strange. I guess I never thought about this <laughs> <laughs> because it's been a normal thing. Yeah. Um, I assume that the reason for it is just quantity and packaging. Yeah. It's just, I always ask all my Canadian friends, I was like, do you, it's like, first of all, I didn't believe that that myth was true. And then finally someone was like, yeah, oh yeah, it's true. There are provinces where you have like milk bags. And I was like, wow, I, I, I don't get that. Are they like super, super sturdy? Like they, you can't pierce them or anything, or they can't really spill? Well, I mean, you can pierce them, yeah. but they're pretty, pretty sick. Like you'd have to do it pretty hard and oh. you have to be care. I guess they have to be careful while they're um, like in transport yeah. as well. Um, but you put it in like a plastic jug and then you just cut it and then pour, mm -hmm. pour it from the jug. Oh, wow. And I mean, we still have, we have cartons too. So it's yeah. just. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, cause that's just such a, that's just so different from what I'm used to and all the Americans are used to that. It's just, it's really fascinating to hear. But if you could change one thing about the sport of bodybuilding, what would it be? Um, oh yeah, I know what this, uh, it'd just be, um, more fairness for female competitors. Yeah, we're definitely not making enough money. <laughs> well, the bikinis are because, <laughs> yeah. but uh, those you work harder, you get less, mm -hmm. and and that's not fair. Yeah, absolutely. That's one of the things that I would definitely stress for too. Is just you know, act equal stuff, and just you know, a lot of the a lot of people talk about the politics too that goes on in the sport, and that's something that I'd really like you know to have them look into a little bit more too because it is sometimes unfair, and then just how the standards just change all the time. Cause like we always talk about how they, you know, they took away women's bodybuilding and then co sort of incorporated that into physique. And then that kind of, you know, mixed up a lot of things. So it's just, you know, just making it sort of equal to the guys too, when it comes to representation as well of like what divisions are appropriate and just, 
yeah, it's just one of those things where, I mean, you guys work just as hard as the guys, if not harder, because, you know, the guys already have an unfair advantage starting out as is. Mm -hmm. So it's just, yeah, it's definitely one of those things. That's why I love to also have, you know, especially, you know, like female bodybuilders, fitness competitors, just because people don't realize too, that when people see you, they normally just see the muscle. They don't see the person inside that. They don't realize that there's a, a person inside there. They just see the outside exterior. Do you find that to be difficult at times when like people, you realize that sometimes people just don't, aren't able to get to know the real you because they're so distracted? Um, in a, like in, in a social media setting, for sure. Um, I mean, versus in real life, just, I'm the kind of person that I think, you know, energy speaks volumes, right? So you get to know someone and, and you react according to the energy. So I've never had an issue face to face, but, um, in terms of like in a social media type, uh, setting, which I don't, I don't find it too hard because if people follow me and they can kind of get my personality through that. But um, other than that, like when you get some people who don't really follow or whatever, make it make an assessment. Um, I think like in terms of the muscle fantasy type things, like people think maybe more dominant type personality and yeah. stuff like, which is not really who I am at all. So I'm really like a soft feminine type of person, but I just look a certain way. Absolutely. I mean, and we get that a lot too. And it's just one of those things where I just, to, I just love to, you know, sort of dispel all those myths. And I love, you know, just talking to, about that and just, you know, cause people don't realize, I mean, there isn't enough te attention given, especially to, I mean, even anyone really in the health and fitness community, but we have two final questions on the questionnaire part of the podcast. If you, if someone were to walk up to you on the street and say, you know, obviously, wow, you look amazing. I want to, you know, start to adapt a more healthy and fit lifestyle, not necessarily going to bodybuilding or they could, if they wanted to, but just to adapt a more healthy and fit lifestyle, what would be the best piece of advice that you would give that person in order for them to be successful? This has come out and this does happen to me on a regular basis. So um, the thing that I say is, you know what? You probably know what you need to know. You just need to start incorporating that and you just need to do it. And I said, well, the biggest thing that is important is consistency. Mm -hmm. So just keep going on it. Just be consistent. Start with consistency first. After you got that nailed down, then you can start adding the other things. Mm -hmm. And if you could go back and talk to the 18-year-old version of yourself, what would be the best piece of advice you would give her? Hmm. 18 year old me. Um, love yourself. Yeah. That's an important, that's an important one for me too. For me, it would be, you know, don't try to please everyone because it's not going to happen. You're not going to be able to. That was, I was a big people pleaser back then. So for sure, that would be the one thing that I would ask. So now at what point in your journey did you decide that you sort of wanted to help out others? Or was that something that you always th thought about that you wanted to do? Oh, definitely. I always like helping people. It makes me feel good to help people. Um, so it's definitely something I want to do, but what, um, and I enjoy to do, but I'm still like building my confidence feeling like, cause I, a lot of times I'm like, I know what to do for me, but you know, mm -hmm. telling someone else because I'm not a type. Okay. I work different. So, and I don't believe that you need, like people should be telling, like nobody can, tell someone what to do because you can tell people what to do and they're either a lot of times they're not going to do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I mean, it's about guiding. Mm -hmm. So I can guide you. I can give you, so it gives you the tools, the proper tools to, to, to deal with the things that come up because you know what? It, it's a, as much as it shows physical, it's more of that. It, everything is more mental. It's, it's like an iceberg, mm -hmm. you know, you, the physical part is the part that you see. And then everything else is what you don't see. So that's where most of the work needs to be done. I really appreciate you saying that because a lot of people think that when they look at these big muscular people, that they just must be the most confident people in the world. They just must, you know, just be on top all the time. And then some people just get into weightlifting just to try to gain more confidence. But weightlifting is not going to make you more confident. You have to work on that mentally. It's all about mentally and just being able to accept your, your faults and just being able to, you know, love yourself. That's the most important thing I can do. Cause some people go into that. And then when they get bigger or more muscular or they exercise all the time, they get upset because they're like, I don't feel better about myself, even though yeah. I do look a lot better. It's all about working on it mentally. You can be, you know, the most in shape person on the planet. And if you're not feeling good about yourself, that's not going to change it. It's just all about the mental mindset. Yes, exactly. I mean, you're just, you're just going to look, you're going to look different, but you're still, you still are who you are. And I mean, you can do, people do different types of things to cover that up. 
And sometimes people are using, using weights as a band aid, And maybe sometimes it can start as that, like it has with me and it has started with that. And then now I'm in a place where, you know, I've, I've done so much work on my own self and yeah, what you see is just an outward expression of that. But like, there's so much more work that I've done inwardly that you can't see. And that's, that's big. Like I can, I can watch people. I want, I can, I watch people's Instagram or competitors and stuff like that. And I can still tell the ones that really like, yeah, you're just using this as a focus point. Like this is all that you're focused on. And really there are a lot of things that need to be focused on internally. And I mean, uh, and a lot of people go into, go into weightlifting. I think that ha- had a lot of things that happened in your past and they're using that. Like a lot of people that you talk to, they have had some sort of like, um, eating disorder or they've gone through like sexual abuse or some sort of thing, you know, and they're, they're using something as they're using it as therapy. And is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's both. It can be both. It really, where you're taking that. So, um, it's, it's a great way to take it, but I mean, it's not, it's not the only aspect of it. There's so much more that you need to work on because just doing the physical, if you're just concentrating on purely the physical, you're still, not really going to, you're, you might grow in some ways, but you're still going to be feeling those types of feelings. Mm -hmm. So you really just have to really dig deep and, and go with what is this teaching me and going through that and just being able to enjoy everything, um, enjoy the process to truly love the sport and to truly know, love life as well. And to be able to incorporate everything, your whole life within that. So, um, but journey, like, it's like for everything and it's just a different, it's just a different avenue. People do it in different other aspects of life where they're just focusing on, maybe they're doing drugs, maybe they're doing, maybe they're drinking, maybe they're shopaholics, maybe they're, maybe they're gambling. There's all different types of sex, sex addiction, addiction. There's all different types of outlets. So are you using this as an outlet to cover something up or are you using this you know, to really find growth within yourself and to really sit back and assess that. And that's really important. And there's different, and when you're in different stages and it can start as one and then it can grow and blossom into another. So. Absolutely. I mean, I couldn't have said it better myself. We have just a few questions left. You mentioned that you are planning on competing again. Is there any date or timetable that you have in mind as to when you're going to step on the stage again? Uh, no, I'm not ready to, I haven't figured that out. It's to be determined, um, contemplating next year. So, but still have to, I'm, I'm waiting, I'm waiting for Christmas waiting for Christmas to happen and see how things go from there and contemplating within the next year to sit down in January. Maybe I think I'll sit down and then look at the dates and then, and then decide from there. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And again, you guys, Mandy Squires, go and give her a follow. All of her links down below. This is Dee Dee on the spot, Ryan Johnson signing out. Have a great day, everyone.